Hello and welcome to the Wellness Universe Lounge. You are at the Wellness Universe's learning platform where we host all kinds of shows, workshops, sessions, classes. Um, I myself uh, host shows and sessions. My name is Anna Pereira. I'm the founder of the Wellness Universe. And we also have amazing instructors here that host all kinds of shows, sessions, and classes for you to live your best life. You are at our new series. Uh, we're a couple of weeks in. It's called Self-Care True Stories. And I have been interviewing some amazing, wonderful wellness practitioners that we have in the wellness universe. So today we have Jennifer Whitaker. Jennifer, how are you today? I'm great, Anna. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. So um, I'm going to introduce you to everyone who's joined us live. And I want to say thank you to our live members and our audience. Hello. And everyone who's watching the recording, thank you so much. I'm just going to read a brief bio that's actually on your session page. And there, if there's anything that I left out, be sure to um, share, OK? So uh, Jennifer is an empowerment strategist, a trauma and resiliency informed peer support specialist, a speaker, presenter, and almost, and, and almost a profiler. Jennifer works with clients who are ready to create empowerment through self-awareness so they can interrupt the cycles and feedback loops that lead to undesirable outcomes such as self-sabotage, anxiety, anger issues, depression, generalized unhappiness, and overwhelm. I also want to say, which I love to hear Jennifer say, she straddles, straddles the line between the woo-woo and the science. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Anna. Um, I'm happy to be here. And that really does sum it up. And I said almost a profiler because I'm still taking classes. Um, and I'm uh, planning the, later this year to join a train the trainer program. So I can't officially give myself the title until I've completed that. Awesome. Um, I'm so glad that you're here with me today. Uh, for everyone who's with us, I want to let you know that Jennifer has been a member of the Wellness Universe for, for several years, and we've become very good friends. And I've personally known, you know, um, the traumas that she's lived through and grown up with. And it was really important for me to have her on this show with us today, because I want you to know the Jennifer beyond the Jennifer, who's the coach and um, the specialist to help you through your traumas, because she has endured so much in her life. And, and I really love having our personal conversations with you. And I want to thank you for um, being so um, brave and sharing because you do share bits and pieces here and there when it comes up in conversation when you are speaking about trauma and resiliency and everything else and mm -hmm. like we've been doing on clubhouse lately um but i would love for people to know um the full the full story so so tell me i know that you know you're really passionate about helping people to really transform their lives and 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 get through the trauma and you know um, become more resilient so they can have their best life experience I would love to know from you your your personal story. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, to really to tell my personal story, um, I do have to go back to um, pretty much when I was born, um, because when I was born, um, I was a colicky baby. So from the get go, from the time I was born, I was labeled bad. I was a bad baby. Um, and now that we have a better understanding of what leads to colic, um, it has to do with how babies pick up, um, how they sense stress in their environment. And the stress leads to a lot of times excess crying and digestive issues in babies um, because they're so sensitive. Um, and I was, the, I was the scapegoat from the get-go. Um, so as I grew, um, I had, AD, ADHD wasn't a thing when I was a kid. And I did, looking back um, and understanding what I know now about ADHD, I went through my childhood with undiagnosed ADHD, um, which got me in trouble a lot because there was no understanding of it. So that was just a point of punishment um, and discipline um, and discipline coming from the outside, not the inside, uh, because we know that there's a big difference between the two. Um, both of my parents were abusive in very different ways. My father was ragefully explosive and my mother was really passive aggressive and her comments were really biting and targeted toward um, individuals. Um, 
so she was notorious for saying things in your ear that only you could hear. Um, so when nobody else heard it, whenever I would lash back, then everyone's like, oh, look at that little brat, look how she's acting, but not hearing what led up to me fighting back or me, um, like my dad, having an outburst, trying to push her away. <laughs> um, so again, I was a bad kid um, and I, I was accident prone, which another thing that I've learned that um, because I work with trauma now that gets imprinted in the nervous system. So I've learned that being accident prone is oftentimes a result of unresolved trauma um, that is imprinted in the nervous system. And as I have worked on my own trauma, I'm not as accident prone. I don't have random bruises on my legs where I'm like, oh yeah, I must've ran into something because I would, I would run into tables or bump into things all the time. And I would have these bruises and I didn't know where they came from. Um, and that was through that, that went into well into my adult life as well. Um, so I don't see myself as clumsy anymore. And I don't have those clumsy behaviors the more I work on my own traumas. Um, That's fascinating, I, Jennifer. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt you, but that is really fascinating. I had, mm -hmm. I had never heard of that before. Yeah. And that is really interesting because I am pretty mm -hmm. clumsy myself. As a matter of fact, when I bought my home here in Union, New Jersey, the one, one of the things that attracted me was the hospitals down the street. <laughs> <laughs> and I kid you not, that's not a lie. I'm sorry, yeah. go on. <laughs> no, well, it could be trauma physiology. So if you want help with that, let me know. <laughs> I do. I would like yeah. to explore that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so um, there, so in my childhood, there was a lot of comparing me to my sister. Um, and because of my accident proneness, um, my sister, well, let me take a quick step back. My sister's eight years older than I am. And she had her own coping mechanisms. And um, she very, at a very young age was sucked in to work for the family business. If I remember correctly, I think it was for her 12th birthday at a 12 year old, her birthday gift was being put on the payroll for the family business at 12 years old. Um, so yeah, so I was born into a family business. Um, and it's, it was really, um, if I wasn't doing something to contribute to the family business or to help out, then I was just a problem. Um, it was either or. There was no in between and there was no allowance for, well, Jennifer doesn't want to do this in her life. She has other hopes and dreams for herself. Uh, there was no support for any of that. Mm -hmm. Those things were shamed out of me um, and abused out of me until I gave in to what my family wanted me to do. So I had to... Um, I had to hold in what I wanted for myself and I had to hold in my emotions um, because anytime I would display my emotions, um, that would get me in trouble, it would get me paddled um, or I would be labeled as a whiny brat, you know, depending on what emotion came out. I wasn't allowed to be sad because sadness meant I was a whiny little brat. I wasn't allowed to be angry. If I was angry, that meant I had to endure some sort of you know, paddling or punishment where, um, you know, to, to try to keep the anger out of me, you know, I, I got punished for being angry. So because my parents didn't know how to manage their own emotions, they didn't have the capacity to handle my emotions or my sister's emotions. So that's where discipline came from. And I can't sit here and say that I blame my parents um, for anything because that was normal in the community where I grew up. That's how everybody was. Um, I grew up in a small town in rural Ohio. Um, and the times that I did try to reach out for support and look for help outside my home, um, it was like the movie theater scene in the movie Grease. Um, the rumor got back to my house or got back to the car before you got back from the bathroom. And, um, or you know, before you got home, the rumor made it back to my parents. Um, even if it was somebody within the family, like my grandparents, nobody would hold that in confidence that I was having an issue and just help me hold space. Um, it was, oh, yeah, um, Jennifer came over and talked to us and we just thought you should know. And then there would be hell to pay when I got home because how dare you say something outside the house, even to grandma and grandpa. Um, none of their damn business what goes on in the house. Um, so there was a lot of secrets that at a very young age I had to carry. 
um, wasn't allowed to talk about what was happening in the house. And also, um, when I was, I think, nine and a half, ten, ten and a half, uh, probably ten and a half, mom was diagnosed with cancer. And that was a that was a really, really rough time for me um, because she had her her first round of cancer that led to surgery. And after her surgery, um, her doctor gave her a clean bill of health and said, you're cancer free and sent her home and said, we'll see you in a year. Well, it turns out looking back and this was in the eighties. So cancer research and cancer treatments are not what they are today back then. So she didn't make it a full year before she was in so much pain that she went back to the doctor and they in fact did not get all of her cancer. It um, had metastasized and moved into her lymph system. And by that time, um, it was evident that she needed um, more treatment. Um, and so it was at that point, because after her first surgery, there was no chemo or radiation to follow up. So she went through chemo, she went through radiation. But in that meantime, after she was given the clean bill of health until about nine months later, whenever um, her cancer was back in that time frame, mom discovered that dad was having an affair and she filed for divorce and her and I moved out. Um, we lived in a trailer. And during that time, we had people who would come and help but I was one of her primary caregivers at 11, 12, 13, Main, more so 12, 13 as she declined and got worse because we didn't have overnight care. And if we did have overnight care, that is a memory that has not come back to me at this point because I don't remember anybody spending the night with us through that time. Um, what I do remember is I was so worried about her that I would miss something in the middle of the night because I would um, help her get out of the bathroom and get back into a comfortable place on the sofa or in bed after her post chemo vomiting spells, or she would, she was prone to going in the bathroom and locking herself in the bathroom when she was in the bathtub. And she would, you know, after 45 minutes or so, and she wasn't coming out, I had figured out how to unlock the door and break into the bathroom to help get her dressed help get her to bed. And during that time, like I would sleep with her because I was so afraid that I would miss something in the middle of the night. Um, and then through that time, she would, we would get into these fights where I would scream at her and tell her I hated her. And then she, after she would tell me that I was the reason she had cancer because I stressed her out so much that she developed cancer and people would come to visit and she would point at me and say, just look at her, look at how she's acting. She's going to be the death of me. And then she died. And that created such, a, excuse my language, but I'm going to say it, a mind fuck for my whole entire life where I, and, and it's only been within the last, I don't know, four to five years that these memories have come back to me that she said that because I deeply repressed them. And I didn't remember her saying that until recently. But when I look back over my life, I realize that that's the reason I have pushed people away my whole life. When somebody lets me know that I've hurt their feelings, I disappear. I just, um, I ghost people and I go away for their benefit because I believe I can harm them. And I look at how that has kept me so isolated in my life. And it's my own belief system that did it because I didn't have anybody to help me with that belief system. I was a 13 year old girl with no help after she died to sort through my emotions or my thoughts or anything. So I spent my life protecting other people by disappearing from theirs. And that has harmed me more than anybody else. Jennifer, I just want to say I'm so sorry that you went through that, especially at such an early age in yeah. in a very developed country. You hear stories like this in situations mm -hmm. where it may not be where we have resources. And right. and, you know, where was your sister through all this, by the way? Um, my sister is eight years older than I am. Um, she 
was married and pregnant with her second child when mom died. And she used to say to me all the time because she was under a lot of stress too. And it was overwhelming for her. Again, intellectually, I understand it. But in that um, sensory, like inner child sense, um, it still hurts. She said to me all the time, I don't have time for you. I can't do this right now. Just go away. So I learned that I nobody had time for me. Um, my father used to say similar things. I don't have time for this. He would tell me how he could not wait until I got my driver's license so he didn't have to drive me around. He bought me a vehicle about six months before I turned 16 years old and I lived in a rural part of the state. I would drive that car around without a permit, without a license, just to get myself from point A to point B. Um, and because we had a family business and because we um, had more money than those around us, it was a, it's a really poverty stricken area. Um, everybody just thought it was okay, you know, because, and, and that was another thing I heard. You have money, you have everything you could possibly want. What do you have to be upset about? I can't believe you're sad. I can't believe you're upset. Um, so not having support really had me withdrawing within myself. Um, and as I grew, I got myself into situations where I was um, sexually assaulted and date raped because I didn't know any better. Um, I got myself into a cycle of abuse because I abuse was normalized for me. And what's normalized, we are blind to. So I found myself in relationships that were um, a lot like my mom and dad's relationship. They were volatile and they were abusive. And I would find myself in these abusive relationships and then I would just run. I would disappear. I'm like, I can't do this. Um, and that was a cycle that happened over and over and over again. Um, and it was my late thirties when my career path that I had chosen for myself really just wasn't working out for me. And I switched careers to become a massage therapist. Sorry, I'm having a little sinus issue too. <laughs> um, okay, allergies, spring allergies. Yep, yes. spring weather. Yep, spring weather brings sinuses and allergies. Um, but um, when my career path um, wasn't working for me, which I was a teacher at the time, um, I ended up switching careers. I went back to school to get my license as a massage therapist. And that's when I discovered myofascial release therapy. Um, now that's another whole story, but that opened the door to um, energy work. Um, that opened the door to a whole different realm that I wasn't aware of at that point in my life and a whole different realm of healing that was in the complementary and alternative field. Um, and what I ran into initially were people who um, tried to push their agenda onto me, um, didn't know how to lead by listening or lead by following, if that makes sense. Um, so they were really pushy about, oh, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. And I was still externally focused. Um, but each little step taught me something new. Even though there were moments of it that re-traumatized me, it led me to something else. So um, I ended up discovering um, body-based approaches to trauma that work with the nervous system and work with the physiology. And that's when things really started to shift for me. Um, and that's what I've been clinging to because a lot of the other stuff I've, I've let go of, like I don't do myofascial work anymore. Um, it, was, it was beneficial, but it's not the end all be all when it comes to healing. Um, and there were elements of that that re-traumatized me because a lot of the therapists were not trauma-informed. Um, and to me, that's dangerous, not having trauma-informed therapists. Um, oh, gosh, I think we just lost Anna. Um, yes, and I'm back. Oh, there you are. I'm like, I don't know what just happened. <laughs> um, your your but, last sentence, yeah. I missed. Oh, yeah, but it was, um, I apologize. Yeah, not having trauma informed therapist was um, something that re traumatized me. Um, and so I'm really careful about being trauma informed, um, and also resiliency informed now. And the why behind the profiling work that I do is because of all the secrets and all the lies that I've had to carry. And it has attracted to me to pathological liars. And the last relationship that I had, um, that particular ex was um, masterful at lying. 
uh, lied to me. He lied to me about everything from going to the grocery store and buying cans of soup to did you change the furnace filter to uh, tell me again where you were last night? Um, so after that relationship ended, I'm like, there is no way. I'm like, how can I find out not how to be lied to anymore? And that took me into body language and statement analysis classes. And what I've come to realize is that those classes really are all about understanding nonverbal communication and how the subconscious mind shows itself. Um, because the subconscious is trying to tell the truth, even though our words in our mouth might be trying to hide the truth. And so it's finding ways that that ekes out. Um, and that's how we give ourselves away. And I find it um, really helpful to combine that with um, the trauma work I do. And that has led me to shadow work and parts work. And parts work has been really, really powerful for, for me to do the archetypal work, the parts work, and the shadow work, because that's all about myself. And it's all about getting different aspects of myself to work together instead of battle inside me. Um, so that's a lot of the why behind my trainings. <laughs> that's Jennifer. First, I want to say thank you so much for coming in and sharing. Cause I know it's not easy to even have this conversation. It's not something you want to think about daily, especially after all the work that you've done for yourself and on yourself and with the, you know, the many that you have worked with and, and all the different um, techniques uh, that you have gone through and, and several you've shared here as well as many that we've spoken about. And mm -hmm. I, I just wanna say thank you for being brave enough and, mm -hmm. and being open to having this because I know excavating it, it still brings up a lot of stuff. And I just, mm -hmm. I, I really wanna honor you sharing this with us today because I know it's not easy. I just wanna take it over to I don't know why I'm having technical issues today. <laughs> yeah, I know you just locked up again. And so I was going to hop in if you didn't come back. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, good thing that we're, we're good at this, right? There we are. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm back now, right? Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know what's happening today. I even restarted my computer to make sure stuff like this wouldn't happen, but the gremlins are, in, are back in, uh, back in my uh, laptop, I guess. So um, I'm sorry that I, I cut out everybody. Um, so Jennifer, now we know, you know exactly where you've come from and what has inspired you to take the journey that you have and why you're so passionate about um, co your continued learning, your continued um, awareness, your continued um, practices um, to keep unfolding so you can help more people. Uh, before we get into your self-care tip, um, Share share with us a little bit more about the different ways that you are just really quickly, just if you could list them off. I did I did in the bio, but if you could just list off exactly what it is that you do and then share with us a tip that we can take away. Okay. Yeah, because I do a lot of things and I roll all of the different things I do into my empowerment strategy program when I work with clients. So um I'm a trauma coach and I work with the subtleties of developmental and generational trauma. So I don't work with the big issues. Um, I don't work with somebody who's diagnosable or syndromal because that's more in the lane of therapy and clinicians. And that's not what I do. Um, I work more in my practice like a peer recovery supporter, um, which I am certified through the Ohio Moss program as a peer recovery supporter, which Ohio Moss is mental health and addiction services. And we are taught as recovery supporters and in the trauma trainings that I do, um, it's all relational model, not behavioral model. Behavioral model is top down. It's willpowering and plowing your way through. Bottom up is connecting with your own physiology and finding that choice from within. And that's what I do is I lead by following. Um, so as a peer supporter, as a resiliency trainer, as a shadow worker, as a profiler, um, as a somatic experiencing practitioner, um, I'm even an ordained minister, which most people don't know about. Um, all of the stuff I do, I am trained to lead by following. So I listen to my clients and, and I know you've heard me do this, Anna, I'll say what I'm hearing is, and I hear a lot of times the strength come out in the story and we're not trained to hear our own strengths. We're trained to hear our own 
weaknesses and what's wrong. And so a lot of times I will reflect back and like, hear what you're saying. And also, do you hear this? Because there is a skill to it. And I didn't have that skill until recently. Um, so I think that is really what sets me aside from other therapists is I don't have an agenda. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do before we enter into session. I work with what shows up the day that we're in session. I don't I, I don't even have an agenda to pick up where we left off last time because where we left off last time is not where you are today when you walk into the into the video or into the room. I work with what presents itself in the moment. And again, I think that's what sets me aside is I don't have that agenda and I'm not telling people what they need to do. I'm I'm listening. So yeah, I'm listening to what what is going to work for you and where is your strength and how can we build on those strengths? That's what I do. I love that. And this is why I guess I mm -hmm. am so pulled towards you, you know, why we became such great friends. And I and I am mm -hmm. such a, um, a a fan of your work and always mm -hmm. I always refer you out. Um, so so, Jennifer, you have something that we can do on our own as a self-care tip to help us live a better life. Mm hmm. Yes, okay. absolutely. Please and share. Reach over and grab this. Um, I keep this by my desk and this is a feather. Um, it's a morning dove feather. And what this does is this is a little reminder. And so I encourage everybody just to look around your room and I see the little dog hanging over your chair. Um, that wouldn't be there if it didn't mean something. So look at things that are resources. Resources are reminders of what gives us strength, um, what helps us get through hard times, um, it and they help us um, uplift us, give us strength, and help us get through hard times. So whenever we think about resources, and a lot of times they're souvenirs that we bought on vacation. Usually, when you're on vacation, you don't buy a souvenir because you're feeling like crap when you're doing it. You're like, oh, look how cute this is. This is adorable. I want to take this home, or this is gorgeous, or look at this piece of artwork that I can't find anywhere because the art in this part of the world is different than the art in my part of the world. Um, and uh, so whatever those resources are, think about what was what were you experiencing when you bought it? Like what was, I love birds. I have a backyard bird station, you know, like feeder station in my backyard and it attracts songbirds. It attracts the, um, this is backwards. I keep moving my hand the wrong way. It attracts the um, uh, Cooper's hawk that likes to hunt at my bird feeder. <laughs> um, so I get everything and it's, but it's, watching nature and observing nature that really, really reconnects me to myself and to who I am. And what I experience inside myself is an expansive feeling. It's a more joyous feeling. Um, and it's not those heavy emotions that really weight me down and feel uncomfortable. I am choosing to focus on a resource because when I really can focus on this little reminder of my bird feeder station and how active my backyard is because I have a ravine property. It I can focus on this and in my mind, the image takes me to my backyard. And if I, sometimes if I close my eyes, I can even focus on what do I hear when I'm in my backyard? And I can hear in my mind, the songbirds and I can hear the, the cardinals and their very distinctive chirps versus the woodpeckers and all of the different you know, bird calls. And it brings a smile to my face. It brings a little bit of joy to my heart. And it's so important to tap into that experience, not just the memory or the thought of it, but the whole experience. And just remember how good it feels in my body and to tap into that sensory experience as I'm resourcing and to stay in that sensory experience for that minimum of 14 seconds, like we've talked to before, because that 14 seconds is what creates neuroplastic practices and it's what lays down new neural pathways. And that's the paradox. You can't think your way into um, rewiring your brain into neuroplastic practices. It's experience that creates them, not thought. And that's what I really do with people is I help them um, reconnect with that experience and that authentic experience of who they are um, without um, all the thought and analysis and logical reasoning getting in the way. I love that tip, Jennifer. And yes, 
I love it when you share that tip because I think a resource is so powerful. And mm -hmm. um, we've, we mentioned all of these different um, ways that you can have these resources around you, a feather, a piece of artwork. I have mentioned if it's a fragrance or if it's um, a talisman or something that you can put in your pocket, like a crystal, you've mentioned that as well. So yeah. um, I think that that's my fragrance really, too. <laughs> I, I think these are really great, really great tools. And, and again, to really embrace and envision and take yourself back to, you know, the whole experience of it is, is really the dynamic piece of it, not just to look at it and admire it for what it is, but to get into the space of where it is that you were when you, when you found it, the, the mm -hmm. sounds that are around you, the sensations that are around you. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're actually at our half hour, a little bit over at this point. Um, I just wanted to um, thank everyone for giving us these extra couple of minutes. Um, so, and I wanted to hear from you in the audience, if you have any questions or any comments for Jennifer, please put it in the chat box. Mm -hmm. So Kathy says, a strong and courageous history. Thanks for the honesty. I hear you. I see you. Your story is in my heart. Yes, Kathy, thank you. And and Jenny says, nature is my Zen zone too. You give such fabulous advice. And mine too, Jenny. And I and I know she, when she was speaking of birds that she that me and you were, you know, perky eared about that because we love our birds. I also want to mention everyone that I just copied and pasted Jennifer's information to her um, wellness universe uh, profile as well as all of her other places you can follow her and connect with her. Recently, we've been speaking on Clubhouse a lot. She hosts a room every Wednesday over there if you're on Clubhouse. Um, Cindy says, thank you for sharing. This was helpful. And also, um, as a, a member of the Wellness Universe, uh, Jennifer also invites you to join the Wellness Universe. I'm going to share uh, her link with you in case you would like to become a member if you're a practitioner of wellness. Um, please check us out. And you can use that link uh, on behalf of Jennifer. Uh, and she'll she'll definitely connect with you and give you some ins and outs about the wellness universe and help you out if you would like to become a member. Um, and I see that Sheila M is typing, so it, I don't want to cut anyone off. So if you're typing a comment or a question, okay, Sheila says, beautiful interview, ladies. So with that, what is your final thought, Jennifer, for today's session? And I want to thank you once again for sharing your story and everything that you do. Um, my final thought or little tip for people is to remain curious with people um, because when we aren't curious, we're more likely to step into judgment and we're more likely to think we know what's going on with them when we truly don't. Um, even the people in my house that lived with me um, many times in my life didn't know what I was experiencing inside myself because they didn't know how to ask the right questions and they weren't curious. So much of my suffering has been inside myself and the world never knew. Um, so the more we can remain curious with people, curious is what creates safety in relationship and curiosity is what allows people like me to be able to get past the shame and share our stories. Yes, and thank you because you are you are making the world a better place with all that you do, Jennifer, and being so brave and and stepping out and you know healing yourself and helping others to heal. Um, and your story, I'm sure many can relate to. And um, those of you in our audience, and if you're watching the recording, um, please share this. Uh, I think that Jennifer's story resonates with many, many, many people, more than we know, because these are the stories that go untold, that go hidden, mm -hmm. until the damage is overwhelming and imposing upon our lives and manifesting in physical and mental and emotional ways. Um, so please, take a moment and think about a friend or someone that you love that would benefit from Jennifer's story and please share this with, with them. And uh, again, if you're here with us live, thank you so much. And the recording will be available in a couple of hours. Um, and thank you, Jenny, for, for being here and Vanessa for uh, helping us uh, get through the technical challenges here on the back end. Uh, and I just want to say, Jennifer, I love you dearly. You're, you, you've, I've come to know you as a friend, as well as a member of the Wellness U uh, Universe and a resource for um, total well-being. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing all that you do with unconditional love for those that come to you seeking your support. And again, you said it best, having no agenda. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Anna.
Um, I, I really appreciate getting to know you as well. And I love you too, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Next week, we're going to take a little hiatus and then we're going to continue on with this um, series the following week. So please tune in on Thursday mornings at 11 o'clock. Be sure to register for each individual uh, session in the series. Uh, every single one is separate with a new guest. And I just want to say thank you so much and have a day to treasure.